Well, welcome and happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. I've got my daughter Isabella with me this morning because when we watch United online, she's always sitting on the sofa mocking me and making fun of me. So I wanted to have her come and I'll, she can just be me for the welcome this morning. So Bella, why don't you do what you normally do, sitting on our sofa, watching online at home. Okay. Good morning, United. I'm Tim Wolf, the lead pastor here at United. Today we're going to be diving back into the series, Sent, where we're focusing on the chapter Acts 19 if that the Apostle Paul wrote. Yeah, it goes something like that. She's always mocking me, but that's the message part. This is the welcome part. We're telling people, like, thanks for joining us. What do we usually say when people are joining? It usually goes like, hey, I'm Tim Wolf, and we, would, we are so glad that you're joining us here at United Today. If you could just take a few seconds to check in underneath the video, there's going to be a blue box that says check in. If you can do that so that we can see what your prayer requests are, that would be great. Cool, good job. So she does a pretty good job. Of make, so she does that and kind of like makes fun of me for doing it though. And, and so when you check in today, just so you know, like uh, every check in, I'll give Bella a dollar to see how well she really? did today. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna, I'm just doing that to try to get people to check in. Um, anyway, so, uh, but Bella is a PK. If you've never heard that phrase before, PK means pastor's kid. Uh, and so that means that she can kind of be a fly on the wall for the behind the scenes stuff here at United. And in our house, uh, you know, she's been overhearing some leadership conversations and leadership meetings. She's been hearing Marie and I talk about this thing called regroup. Uh, so you've probably heard about that a couple weeks now if you've been following with us. But Bella, what have you been hearing about regroup? Yeah, well, we're really going to be focusing on doing groups instead of a Sunday morning. We're still going to be having a Sunday morning, but we're going to focus on groups because we want to grow closer with our relationships with each other and with God. And we also want to help like show Jesus through uh, our relationships. Cool. Awesome. So yeah, regroup is, there, we're trying to shift in focus of, you know, from a Sunday morning focus or centric experience to a group centric experience. And so if you're in a group uh, then you're a part of United, and if you're not part of a group, it's going to be really hard to be a part of United. So part of regroup is, hey, groups are more important than ever, and we're going to be relaunching groups in a new way coming up. They're all going to be online this summer, um, and even our weekend experiences, we predict, will through the summer be online experiences, and there's going to be more details coming up about that. Well, we wanted to share a quick Easter update of what we did with our offering. So we donated 100% of the offering to healthcare workers and first responders. We've been able to provide meals to 13 and counting organizations and businesses with essential workers. And over 300 essential workers have received a meal of Thanksgiving because of your generosity. We've partnered together with essential workers at United. They've been able to bring in these meals and surprise their coworkers. It's been a really practical way for folks at United to share their faith at work during this pandemic. So United, thank you for your generosity and for giving to the mission of United, which is helping people know and follow Jesus. Because you give to United, we're able to give and be generous in our community. Bella, how do we usually frame up how to give online if people haven't started giving online, which they do? Yeah, well, if you want to give, there's a, there's a safe and secure way. If you just click the Give button right underneath the video, that would be great. Awesome. Good job. And you know what? Uh, we don't take a break from giving. God doesn't take a break from his work, and we're not taking a break from our work here at United. And, and so I want to encourage you and challenge you, even to test God. Maybe this time is a testing time for you. Like, I don't know if God's going to provide for me or come through. You know, the Bible actually talks about one way we can test God is through giving. And he talks about this tithe, which is the 10% concept of giving towards the mission of his purposes and expanding on earth. And when we do that, God promises to come through for us. And so United, more than ever, I want to encourage you to give, to not take a break, because God's not taking a break on us, and we shouldn't take a break, not just in giving, but in living for Him. Yeah. And before we jump into the message, we have a really fun gift for all the moms. One reason my mom is a hero of quarantine is because this past week she put together a stay-at-home prom for me and my sister, which was a complete blast. We got to get dressed up and just dance with the family and have a lot of fun. Moms are the real quarantine heroes because they are there for you and emotionally and physically. She's doing so much in this quarantine. She's schooling us and she's cooking and cleaning and she's making sure to spend lots of time with us and watch movies that we want to watch and play games. 
friends and just make us happy. Um, mom is the best because she gives us fun activities during the quarantine. My wife is the real hero of this quarantine because of how well she takes care of our family. She keeps the home clean. She takes the lead on making sure our pantry is stocked. She educates the children. And above all, she just keeps us all sane. Nikki is a therapist who specializes in working with first responders. So she's our hero during quarantine because she's been able to continue to book clients through telehealth and be able to keep them in a good, healthy, emotional state. Because she plays with me and gives me toys and she makes fun. Wife, you are the real hero of the quarantine because you have taken care of the household and kept our children safe, kept us safe, kept my hands clean and sanitized when I come back from the grocery store. Thank you for helping me and um, helping me with my work because it is hard. And um, about this coronavirus stuff, it's just really difficult. And um, we all love you, Mom. We hope you have a really, really good day for Happy Mother's Day. Because she planned fun things for us. And, get, and we got to go bike riding, we got to make fires, we got to roast marshmallows with my, with my mom and dad. Melissa is the hero of our family all the time, not just during quarantine. She does an awesome job at, at loving us loving God. She's been able to find awesome opportunities to not only serve our family but also our community and we just are so blessed to have her. They are there to make sure that you get it done and to just make sure that you're doing well. They are there for support and to keep the house together. <laughs> My mom's a hero because she feeds us and keeps us healthy. My mom's a hero because she helps me play my piano and it takes a lot of patience. My mom's a hero because she helps us do our school quicker. She uh, put band-aids on my little fingers. She wet my rag. She wishes me. My mom is the best because she keeps me in check when I get emotional and she takes care of the house and all of us in it. That um, she lets us wake up at 7.30 um, every Saturday morning and lets, us watch, and lets us watch TV. And best of all, we got mom gets us ice cream. You've been, support, you've been supportive of me ever since I came out the womb. And I know I can talk to you about everything without getting judged. Thanks for all the things you've done in the past life. I know it's been a um, you treat me well. I love how you helped me in my homework this morning and I got it done fast. She's the best because she's my mom. She is one of the greatest people I know. I look up to her so much. She's just self-sacrificial and loving and so hardworking and I don't know what I would do without her. Oh my mom, she's the best. We love you and thank you for being a fantastic mother, a great caretaker, and uh, just a fantastic wife. Happy Mother's Day, I love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mama, I love you. Happy birthday, I love you. I love you, Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom, I love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, bye. Love you, Mom, love you. I love you, Mom, Happy Mother's Day. Well, moms, you are the heroes of the quarantine and all of life in general. Happy Mother's Day. When I think of our home and our children and the mom in our home, my wife Maria, I think of my youngest son, Toby. Toby loves to play games. Like, he loves playing games so much, he'll play Monopoly against himself. We even have three versions of Monopoly that will be out at the same time. In fact, if you come into our home on a normal day, you'll probably wonder where the floor is because it's just covered with game after game after game that Toby has 
has out trying to play one game with a sibling or play another game with himself. And um, oftentimes he doesn't like to play a game by himself. I don't think most of us do. And so he will always try to get somebody to play with him. And just recently, nobody was up for playing with him. They were all in the midst of doing school or busy. And so was my wife. My wife was a normal afternoon for her, which is busy of homeschooling five children, uh, trying to think about what we're having for dinner that night. She's choreographing a musical that's probably not going to happen. And yet she's got this seven-year-old boy saying, Mom, Mom, play a game with me, play a game with me, play a game with me, not giving up, relentless. And what does my wife Maria do? She stops what she's doing and she sits on the floor and makes my son Toby's day by just playing a game with him and spending time with him. And moms do a great job of helping their kids feel loved, valued, seen, appreciated. And uh, my mom uh, is a hero as well to me. So I remember just disrupting her life sometimes at night. She would be reading a book in bed and I would often uh, climb on to the end of the bed and just start asking a couple questions. And she would start asking me a couple questions. And, and before we knew it, we did this long conversation where she probably just wanted to unwind from her day and read a book. And when I think of my wife, who's a mom of five children, and my mom uh, and the disruptions that they face, I'm so glad that they often see those disruptions from their children as opportunities to value them, to love them, and to appreciate them. Moms, you are heroes in all of life um, because of these small disruptions, which can be huge disruptions at times, and yet you lean into those and create opportunities. Um, One of the masters in fact, of, as we talk about disruptions in life, you know, all of us get disrupted, you know, whether it's a phone call at an inopportune time or standing in a long line uh, at a store that seems like a disruption when you're trying to get somewhere um, or at the huge disruption of the COVID virus that this has definitely been a massive disruption to our life. Uh, and so we can all relate to disruptions, but more than us, Jesus can relate to disruptions. And I want to talk about how disruptions can be made into opportunities today. And as we talk about uh, Jesus um, being disrupted, when you think about his life, some of the, the disruptions that were in his life were kind of um, a little odd and unusual. One night he's at a dinner party having dinner and there's this woman that comes in and starts to just pour out an extreme amount of perfume on his feet, making a scene and disrupting that moment. And yet Jesus turns it into a great opportunity that's one of the most widely told stories of his life. There's another story in the life of Jesus where he's taking a nap. I don't know how he's taking a nap in the midst of this storm on a boat. And in the midst of this uh, storm, that the disciples are freaking out because they think they're going to die. That's how bad the storm is. And they wake Jesus up. They disrupt him from his little nap there. And yet Jesus creates another opportunity to help the disciples know who he is as he speaks um, to the winds and the waves and, and everything. The storm calms down in that moment. Jesus is the master of taking disruptive moments and creating opportunities. And I want us to follow in his example of how do we um, become masterful in seeing the disruptive moment of this COVID-19 virus or maybe even just other smaller disruptions to our life and see the opportunity behind them. I want to look in Mark 2. It's one of my favorite stories and favorite uh, interruptions in the life of Jesus uh, where uh, it's, a, it's a significant disruption. So if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and open up to, that's one of four biographies of the life of Jesus. And uh, it's Mark chapter 2. And I'm just going to start reading in verse 1. And so if you would read along with me, that would be great. And it says, When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. And while he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Now, I think that qualifies as a disruption. I can't even focus on work if there's kids running around on the floor upstairs from me. You know, imagine, you know, people changing the carpet upstairs uh, on the floor above you or doing other things and you're probably a little disrupted and you can't focus so much in that moment. Well, Jesus has a hole being dug in the roof right now. And so not only is he being disrupted in his teaching, but everybody listening to him uh, is being disrupted. It's an incredibly disrupting 
environment. And my question is, what do you think that this paralyzed man friends wanted Jesus to do? I think it's pretty obvious they wanted Jesus to heal their friend. All of the stories that are told so far in Mark, if you're reading in Mark and you just look back, it's talking about Jesus healing person after person, Jesus healing many people. And so they're bringing their friend to Jesus so that he would be healed. And here's what happens next. It's a little disarming. And it says, Jesus, who's seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. Now, hold on a second. Like, that's not why we brought our friend to you, Jesus. Uh, We didn't come to talk about sin or to have sins forgiven. It's kind of like going to five guys ordering a burger and you get served a salad. Uh, Not what you're expecting at all, but check out what happens next. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven or stand up, pick up your mat and walk? I don't know about you, but neither of those seem pretty easy for anybody to do, to heal anybody or to forgive sins. And yet Jesus is saying that he has the ability to do both. And then he says this in verse 10, I'm going to prove to you that the son of man has the authority to forgive sins. So he's going to prove and make his point that he can forgive sins. And says, then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and he said, stand up, pick up your mat and go home. The man jumped up and he grabbed his mat and he walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. I don't know if you've heard this story before or not. I grew up hearing this story uh, as a kid and even as a teenager. And, and oftentimes there would be an emphasis on the, the miracle that Jesus can heal uh, and, and the power of his healing uh, abilities and miracles that he did throughout the Bible, which is certainly something to, to know and understand about Jesus and is important. Um, but uh, even as a, ki- a kid in the kid's Bible, as I read certain kid's Bibles to my children, when we come to this story, one of the Bibles even says, you know, what great friends this paralyzed man had that they would bring him to Jesus to be healed. Do you have good friends? And the unfortunate truth is that's missing the point. See, this disruption to Jesus was not just an opportunity to heal, but it was an opportunity for something much greater. It was an opportunity to go on record saying a couple of really important things. One, I'm God. Because the Pharisees and the religious leaders are saying like, you can't forgive sins. Only God can forgive sin. And Jesus is kind of like, yeah. I'm God and I can forgive sin. I have the authority to do that. And the second thing that he's making known in this moment is this is the reason that I have come to bring complete wholeness, not just physical healing and doing great miracles, but spiritual wholeness as well. The most important part of Jesus' ministry was the ability to forgive sin, to bring spiritual cleansing and to remove the guilt and shame that people carry especially when we come to God and feeling unworthy and to remove that, to make us know that we are loved and forgiven our sin. And Jesus goes on record. And that's the most important part of this story, but it wouldn't be known if Jesus didn't embrace disruption. If Jesus was just trying to move forward and plow through whatever teaching it was and ignore the disruption of the moment, We wouldn't have heard this story. We wouldn't have heard this great news. This man wouldn't have been forgiven his sins and all the people present wouldn't have known that Jesus has the ability to forgive sin and make people new. And we can see this now because Jesus embraced disruption. And so my question is for you and I, do we embrace disruptions in our life? Or do we reject them, pushing them off as if uh, it's not part of God's plan for our life? Even as we think about the massive disruption of the coronavirus and that it's brought to all of our lives. I mean, this is an epic disruption without a doubt. Are we still complaining about it? 
Are we still thinking things are just, I just want to wait it out until life can go back to normal? Like, do, are we living life like it's on pause right now? Or have we embraced the disruption? Because I wonder if Jesus' example here would have us say, God, what are you trying to do right now in my life? What are you trying to do in the lives of people around me? Rather than just continuing to complain about the coronavirus or about how local officials are responding to it for better or for worse, are you asking what opportunity God has for you right now? Are you asking God, is there something that he wants you to see that you haven't seen yet? See, the person who embraces disruption is the person who's going to more fully live for God and experience God in this life. And that's what, you know, the, the story of Jesus here, and, you know, the main point is he's able to forgive sins, but he, he does that in a moment where he's embracing disruption. I, I, there's another story of a kind of a disruptive moment in history uh, in a certain sector of business that I wonder if you've heard the story before. If not, you've, you've certainly witnessed it to some degree. Uh, have you ever been to a store called Blockbuster? Yeah, it looks kind of like this, uh, the picture that's on the screen right now. If you have never seen that before, you're probably younger than 20 years old. Uh, but there was a time where you would go to this store uh, and you would, you know, look through what movies were available on a VHS. So that was before DVDs and Blu-ray. And you would pick that out, rent it for the night, and then bring it back the next day. If you are not um, familiar with Blockbuster, go and hit pause. And if there's somebody that you're sitting with that's a little bit older, ask them about their Blockbuster experience. But um, I remember one time in a snowstorm when schools were canceled and my brother and I were sick of watching The Price is Right and Jerry Springer and whatever else was on TV. We said, we just need to watch something else after whatever, day three or four of schools being canceled. We walked three miles to a Blockbuster video to rent a VHS and then turned around and walked three miles back home just to watch a movie. You know, today you can just hit play on your remote control on, on your TV and be able to, to watch um, a movie. But at that time, uh, that's Blockbuster was the big store. In fact, Blockbuster's peak was at about 2004. 2004, Blockbuster's peak revenues and value was estimated around $6 billion. It's a lot of money, $6 billion. They had 9,000 stores, 60,000 employees. Well, in the summer of 2004, there was a smaller little company that was also kind of in on the home movie watching experience that came to Blockbuster with a proposal saying, we would love for you to buy our company. Um, you're the bigger company. We'll sell it to you for $50 million. That company was Netflix. $50 million is a drop in the bucket for a company that's valued at $6 billion. And as the story is told, the executives at Blockbuster laughed at those that were making the proposal from Netflix. Now, if you don't know what Netflix was then, uh, let me help you because it's not at all what it is now. Uh, this picture here is a picture of what you would get in the mail from Netflix. It's a DVD that would be mailed to you, um, and then you would watch the DVD and mail it back. You know, my wife and I had this plan, and we would watch about two to three movies a month, not in one day, from Netflix. And uh, to be part of this plan. And so Blockbuster wasn't very impressed with their model. Um, they didn't necessarily think Netflix had a corner on the market by any means. And that's why they laughed at them. But as the story goes, the very next year, um, Blockbuster's revenues fe fell $1 billion. Um, and that's when the fall of Blockbuster started and when the rise of Netflix began. If you're a visual person, check out this graphic and it helps you to see exactly how far Blockbuster has tanked and how significantly Netflix has grown. Netflix that continued to ask questions about how can we help people watch movies at home and have a better experience watching movies at home. They rose to what some people believe to be about $65 billion, 10 times what Blockbuster was valued at in its peak. Now, here's why I share this story is because there was a disruption in the home movie watching market and Blockbuster didn't pay attention to the disruption that was coming. In fact, they just wanted to continue to play the same game plan. They just wanted to continue to hope, even as revenues fell, that something would just go back to normal as they did the same thing. 
And because of that, they no longer exist. There's only one Blockbuster store, and it's not even the chain Blockbuster. It's a privately owned store in Bend, Oregon. But they failed to see the disruptive moments and trends and embrace them. They didn't see the opportunity to grow and to expand. See, I don't want you personally to be like Blockbuster in the midst of this disruptive moment and miss the opportunity that God has for you to grow. I don't want United as a church or any church for that matter to miss the moment that we have an opportunity to continue to move forward in the mission of God, sharing the hope of Jesus with the world. This is not a time to hit the pause button in church and just wait till things go back to normal and hit play again. This is not a time for us to just put Jesus on hold and to take a break and binge watch movies and do whatever it is that's on our bucket list for the COVID virus and knock off the list of house projects. This is a time where there are opportunities that exist. And I don't fully know what all those opportunities are. But when you think about the environment that we're in, this is the most disruptive moment of history, arguably. Schools are canceled for months. Sports and entertainment venues, concerts are canceled. The Olympics this summer are canceled. Dentists are working on the front lines with emergency workers because there's not enough hospital workers in major cities. You know, for weeks, I don't know about you, but for me, I I was just hoping that this would just all go away, would pass over really quickly. Um, And, you know, I was just longing for the days of old, which now are just three months ago, but I was just longing for those days, but I'm not doing that anymore. You know, now I'm asking God every day, what are you doing what are, you, what are you trying to help me see that I haven't seen before? What are you wanting to do in my life personally as a husband, as a dad, with my free time? What, what are you wanting me to see, God? And for United as a church that I have the opportunity and privilege to pastor and to lead, what do you have for us as your people? You know, and I don't want to be like Blockbuster and just wait for things to go back to normal or just hope things will, you know, will keep coasting through with the same plan that we've had. You know, and I've also wondered as I've prayed in this time, if there are things coming across your mind, as you pray, as you think, as you reflect, that you thought, maybe I should do that now. Maybe I should try that. Maybe I should explore that a little bit more. Um, and I, and this message, I just want to ask your forgiveness. I'm not going to give you very practical things to do, actually. There's one practical thing I'll give you to do, but, but I'm resisting not doing that purposefully because I want you to hear God's voice. I really think and believe that God's been speaking to you about things in your life that are, have deeper significance, about your purpose um, and what God's created you to do, the calling that he's given to you, um, you know, I, I, don't even, I don't even know, maybe it's just in your relationship with him, things that you've been resisting change in your life. And, and this, this time has created opportunities for you to re- reflect a little bit more. And, and I want you to hear God's voice more than my voice. You know, I, I, I don't know about you, but I've noticed a lot of changes already just because of this virus. Specifically, our family has gone out for walks uh, as a family walk almost every late afternoon. Um, And typically when we go for those walks three months ago, we wouldn't see anybody. But today, we're seeing people in our neighborhood we've never seen before. We're, We're seeing teenage kids hanging out with their parents that I'm sure didn't hang out before. We see teenagers playing in their yards with their adult parents uh, in their front yard, which is really cool to see. And I haven't seen that in three years in my neighborhood. And I've been driving by these houses for three years now. You see, things are happening. We're having experiences. We're having family dinners again. And we might be annoyed and like done with this season, like ready to move on. But I wonder if some of us are saying, this is nice. This is a nice way to do life. I actually have a day where I rest now. Actually, I'm tired of resting. I'm ready to get to doing something. And I'm wondering if some of these different experiences that we've had because of the force of being quarantined, or the forced quarantine in our life, if these things are helping us to think more deeply about what is it that we're living for? See, we're, I think we're living in a pivot point in history where 
businesses are going to be changing. Education is going to be changing. Churches are going to change. And I think people will change too. I don't know if that change is going to be good or bad. I have no idea. But for you and I, I wonder if COVID-19 and his follower of Jesus Christ is a wake-up call that God could use this for good in our life. That we turn to God today and embrace the disruption. Remember, Jesus embraced the disruption, Netflixed. You know, they, they, they got rejected by Blockbuster, but they, they continued to move forward. And I wonder if you and I, if we embrace disruption, stop complaining about the virus, stop fighting it and resisting it and just wishing it away, we would say, God, what's the opportunity for me to grow in my walk with you? What's the opportunity to build bridges with a neighbor or a friend or a coworker that I haven't really connected with before? What's the opportunity to maybe just take some time to pull back and reflect on what it is that I'm doing with my life and is that what I'm supposed to be doing with my life? You know, What's the opportunity that's in front of you? Are you embracing the, the disruption or not? I don't want you to see this as a break. Uh, I want you to see it as an opportunity. I don't want you to be lazy and, or wait to be asked to do something by some boss or coworker or somebody at church, but to take some initiative and to, to say, try something new. I think God has put a dream in your heart and a voice that maybe even in your mind that's been bouncing around for a little bit. And, and maybe it's time just to take a step in the right direction, in that direction. Um, to pray about it and to take one step to be faithful. And maybe even just this whole month, the rest of May at least, is a month for you to just go to God and pray. And pray specifically, what is the opportunity? What is the thing that you're calling me to do? What is the passion that you've given me? What is the gifts that you've given me? Am I using those things or am I squandering them? Because right now you can have opportunities to self-reflect and move forward. Maybe you're thinking, Tim, I'm super busy. I've never been busier in my career field and whatever it is that, that you do. Like you're thinking, I don't have that time. Well, I would encourage you to try to pull away and take some time to be with God and to hear his voice. Don't fall into blockbuster thinking about how things used, used to work and we're just going to go back to that way. Paul, the Apostle Paul, writes in the book of Ephesians, he talks about be careful as how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. He's, he's talking about, hey, there's opportunities that are out there. Make the most of them and learn what the will of God is. And if you're hearing me talk right now and you're just kind of, maybe you're responding, you're kind of like cynical thinking, like nothing's going to change as a result of this disruption. I would just encourage you to pray and ask God to open up your heart and your mind to his spirit. Maybe you're skeptical and you're thinking, well, I don't think anything can be accomplished when we're quarantined or when we're unable to do things. Like, I don't see how we can see this as an opportunity or move forward. I would encourage you to, you know, Ask God to do more than you can imagine. Maybe you're just tired right now or disinterested and you've kind of disconnected from Jesus. I would encourage you to pray that God would restore to you the joy of your salvation. Maybe you're confused and you're just like, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't hear God's voice at all. I don't see anything clearly. I don't have any clear direction. Maybe you just need to start asking God to give you clarity. And maybe you're with me on this as I'm talking about, and yes, I'm longing for more. I want to see the opportunities. I want to grow. I want, you know, this disruption to be embraced in my life and to be used for good in my life and the lives of others around me. I want to see Jesus' name proclaimed and more people come to him. I, I want to see more people live out their personal calling. Maybe yeah, you're all yeses to all these things. And, and I would just encourage you to make sure you're leaning into God, hearing his voice and getting clear direction that he would make clear his ways for you. I've been asking God and praying this prayer for weeks now. And uh, it's been a hard pray to pray, pray, prayer to pray, excuse me, because um, I often just like to go and do. I do, 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 go, go, go. I don't often sit and listen. I, uh, I'm not really good at being and just like sitting in like and understanding the truths of God and just uh, being able to, 
to pause in those moments. Uh, I just want to go do, you know. So it was refreshing when after, you know, two weeks of being cooped up, there was at least some volunteer opportunities to get out a couple times a week and to volunteer and to serve. But this time has allowed me to dig in with God a little bit more, to read and to learn. I've been doing some online coursework. I've been receiving some coaching. And I've been doing more praying. And this time has been incredibly helpful for me personally. And it's also been incredibly helpful for me as I think about United and I'm more excited about what God is doing at, in the lives of people at United and, and what he wants to do in and through United. And if you stick around for a little bit, I think you'll understand why it is that I'm excited. We're going to be starting a new series coming up in a couple of weeks called Made for More. And the heart behind this series is we study and explore the book of Ephesians. It's almost like a follow-up to our study in Acts. We've been going to, we're going to wrap up Acts this month, and we're going to move forward in the book of Ephesians. It's like the constitution um, of the church in the same way, you know, there's a story behind how the United States came into existence, and there's a constitution about how the United States is supposed to function. Well, Ephesians is kind of like the constitution uh, for the church. And as we read through Ephesians, the Constitution might like might have already disengaged with that word because you're like, I am not in- excited about history or constitutions or anything like that. Don't, don't stay with me for a second because this is going to be an incredibly exciting time because what we're going to see is acts lived out in the next you know, generation of the church here through the Apostle Paul and as churches continue to get planted and started where people, they, don't, they, don't, they never saw church as a place to go on a Sunday morning and then come back the next week and that was church for them. Church for them happened outside of those walls Monday through Saturday and we see and hear from the Apostle Paul what that looks like. See, God hasn't wired you um, just to go to church on a Sunday morning. He's wired you to have a specific call calling in your life to make a significant contribution. And Ephesians is going to help you see how you are made for more. Ephesians is going to help you see how you can see people come to Jesus without them ever darkening the door of a church building or a church service. See, Ephesians in in this Made for More series is going to help you see how the hopes and dreams that you have, God has put those in your life and your heart and your mind and he wants you to walk in them. And Ephesians is going to affirm that. It's going to give you clarity on how to move forward in that. And I can't wait to go through this study together. Because it's going to help us to not be like Blockbuster. It's going to be like Netflix and to grow. It's going to help us be like Jesus, most importantly. To embrace a disruptive moment in our life. And to see the opportunity that exists. And I want to pray for you right now because I've been vague about what that could look like. The Made for More series will fill in the blanks a little bit more. But I want first for God's spirit to work in you and speak to you. So I'm just going to pray that you would hear God's voice as you pray. I want to pray that you would see God's direction for your life as you lean into him even more. So let me pray. God, I just pray for each friend that's listening right now that you would open up their eyes to see and their ears to hear your voice, that they would have clear direction in what it means to uh, see the opportunity that exists in their life, um, the, whatever areas they live, work, and play in, to see how you want to use them and work through them in each of those areas. And so, God, I pray that you would give us all eyes to see and ears to hear, that we would move forward and see this interruption and disruption of the COVID virus as one of the best opportunities for us to grow in our relationship with you and being your disciple. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. United, I think this is a pretty clear next step to pray. We should all be praying to God and listening to him to see what he says. Another way that we can do that together is on Wednesdays, and every Wednesday in May, we're having a prayer night on Zoom, but we can still be together. I have been doing it, And it's been a really great way to connect to United and to God. So I encourage you all to do that. Thanks for coming and have a great week.